he hires an intern and the intern sort of walks him through and um, not walks him through necessarily, but sort of holds his hand and makes him feel okay being himself and being the most authentic version of himself. And the person who wrote this film when I directed it was actually my boss and did hire me as an intern. So a lot of the other components of the film are sort of exaggerated or fictitious, but him hiring me as an intern did really happen. Sure, so my name is Lauren Harris and I'm from the Philadelphia area. And then I went to school at the University of Southern California, USC, where I double majored in acting and Spanish. Um, from a very young age, I knew I wanted to be an actor. I didn't really know that I wanted to be involved in producing or anything behind the camera. Um, but then I went to USC. It was a great experience. Pretty much right after graduation, I started acting professionally. And then once I was acting, I realized, oh, you know what? It would be really great to create my own projects. So at my final semester at USC, I studied at the British American Drama Academy in London. It's actually funny. I did um, an acting conservatory for three years also in Normandy um, at the Barrage Conservatory in France. So that was, that's a little connection. Um, but yeah. And then from there, I worked with one of my classmates on a project called It's a Girl Thing, which was really successful in the festivals. I wrote it. She directed. We both produced and we both starred in it. And then from there, I started creating more and more films. And now I'm a bit of a multi-hyphenate between acting, producing. I've both written and directed, but I would say like in order of ranking, it would be acting, uh, producing, then writing, then directing. Okay, okay, okay. Step by step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I think that's um, uh, the usual path for, yeah, for everybody because... You, I don't know, I, I wanted to be an actor I, at the beginning, and then I, I don't know, I, I wasn't interested by different, different stuff, different, uh, uh, um, what, what, what is happening uh, behind the scenes, you know, uh, of camera, and uh, of course, you you want to get involved in different stuff like this. Right. So you always uh, wanted to do this uh, since you were a child, right? I always wanted to be an actor and still acting is definitely where I have the most success in my career. Um, but from the way the industry is shifting with TikTok and all of the multi-platforms these days, it's like you kind of need to be doing everything to be a successful actor. And I wasn't always happy with the way that roles were written for women specifically, or even um, how there was authentic representation through um, you know, the LGBTQ community, the BIPOC community, and I wanted to create more projects that felt like they were authentically representative of the people and the communities that I knew. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's it's kind of um it's obvious you want to to, to you branch out to different activities, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. Um have you um have you yeah, you told me you've you've been to a film school. It was a f film school? Strictly uh, 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 primary of the film school or a uh, university? Or... So both of the schools, so I studied at USC for acting. Then I studied at the British American Drama Academy, um, which was in London. And that was primarily acting. And then before that, I studied at the Barrage Conservatory, which is in Normandy in France. Um, and that was also primarily acting. But at both of those schools, I did get some experience writing. I didn't get a lot um, producing or directing. So definitely on It's a Girl Thing, I really threw myself into the water and I was lucky. My um, partner on it, Augusta Mariano, she had a lot more experience. Her father is a television writer. So she was really good behind the camera and knew what to be looking for. And I feel like she was a really great guiding hand for me um, in entering the producing and writing slash directing field. So I was really lucky to um, make friends who you know helped me find my own path within the industry. Yeah, okay. And this is how you, um, so you started to, to direct and uh, I don't know how many uh, um, films you direct, but uh, can you tell me about your last project? How did you get inspired? Sure. So the last project that I directed is called Defining Dodo and it's a Latinx LGBTQ project. It explores somebody who's coming out while growing up in a machismo culture. And um, that was a really cool project. We actually just did a film festival and Q&A for it at the California International Shorts Festival. And that was really interesting. Um, so it was actually a funny story because 
in the film, um, a boss who is a member of the LGBTQ community, but isn't out yet, um, but is growing up in a Latinx predominant household, he hires an intern and the intern sort of walks him through, um, not walks him through necessarily, but sort of holds his hand and makes him feel okay being himself and being the most authentic version of himself. And the person who wrote this film when I directed it was actually my boss and did hire me as an intern. So a lot of the other components of the film are sort of exaggerated or fictitious, but him hiring me as an intern did really happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, story, uh, background story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, how did you prepare for this uh, film? Was, um, how was it? It was a difficult experience for sure. Um, there was a lot to learn, especially as being a female first time director. I think you have to sort of find your footing among a lot of people who have um, worked more aggressively in the industry before. I think um, approaching it now, I know a lot more. I After that project, I worked during the pandemic on a documentary on human trafficking outside of the Philadelphia area that's going to be making its way through the festival circuit this fall. And that project, I felt a lot more comfortable directing because I had a better idea of shot lists and um, the way that I wanted things to look on camera. Now, when I watch films, I can say, oh, that DP really loved this shot. Like, you can tell the way he's doing it that he thinks this is really cool. But I don't think that I had that same insight before I actually had thrown myself into the position of director. Yeah, but you need to, to practice, I think, because uh, yeah, like you said, at the beginning, you don't. You need to find your way, basically your own way, and then um, after uh, by practicing, you, you're going to find. You're going to find your own way, your your signature, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's why in so many film schools, you know, they have you doing everything behind the camera, even if you're just um, specializing in one thing, because it's so important to know all the different facets of behind the camera work. And uh, how was how was the um, which camera did you use uh, for this one? Oh, gosh. Uh, for Defining Dodo, it may have been a black magic, but <laughs> that's a reach. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. And what about the uh, video editing? We hired an editor for that. Um, I would not say that I am the number one editor, so that was definitely outsourced. <laughs> I can I can edit my auditions um, just enough to submit you know three minute little clips, but I I couldn't edit a film. Uh, you uh, maybe you supervised the, the the editor maybe. Yeah, that that I was watching for sure the clips, and I can tell you what I don't like about an editing, but I couldn't tell you how to do it myself. <laughs> yeah, tell me, tell me which uh, which um, I don't know which things you don't like uh, in editing. Well, I don't like clunky cuts. Like, uh, for example, I just worked on a one film that I was producing. I didn't direct or write it. And that's also going to be coming out this fall. And I was watching a cut of it. And the final shot of it was like just a black, black theater and the main character in the center. And rather than like doing a cut to a wide, it was a close up and then was going to a wide. They had a zoom out shot from the close up into the wide. And I hated it. I hated the zoom out. It felt like not stable enough. It just felt like it took too long. Did not enjoy it at all. So um, I definitely axed that. Yeah, it, it depends the the goal of the, the project. If it's a film, yeah. if it's a commercial, if it's a video, music video, you know, so it depends the, the nature of the project. And I don't like when it goes too much from like a close up to a close up to a close up to a close up. You know, I need more like differentiation. <laughs> You're gonna be sticky otherwise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, can you can you tell me about the sound, the the music, and maybe the lighting as well? Uh, how was it uh, on set? Uh... For defining Dodo, it was actually really interesting because um, it wasn't an argument, but I was a little bit more budget conscientious on defining Dodo. And my co-producer um, was really attached to the idea of having a real mariachi band. And um, this mariachi band that he had wanted was an actual LGBTQ mariachi band in Los Angeles, which is like, how do you even find such a thing? You know. <laughs> but he found this and it was within the theme of our project since we were working with an LGBTQ theme in the film. And 
it was like a little bit out of our budget, but he was so dedicated to it that he worked on a GoFundMe to raise the funds to pay for this mariachi band. And it added so much to the sound of our film because, you know, one of the things that we really wanted was this authentic representation. But by having the authentic music from the mariachi band, it really made the film come to life. And I felt like really stick to the genesis of what we wanted the themes to be. Um, So it's one of those things where I have to wave my white flag that I was wrong and he was right to have the real mariachi band. It was worth the money. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. And what about the the lighting? It was... um... How was it? Was um, outdoor, indoor, maybe? I don't know. There were a lot of different lightings. Um, we had a gaffer, and uh, they did a really great job. There's some scenes that, looking back now, I feel like we have one scene in particular where the lead character overdoses, and you can see the light sort of shining through the room onto him because we wanted to reflect that it was like you know the very early morning. And it's sort of a soft lighting peeping in. Sorry, I have a dog on my lap, so she's just peeking in a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so the lighting was really interesting in that shot. Another thing that I don't like on film was when you're sort of filming at night, but a shot that's happening during the day. So you're blacking out all of the light coming in, but then putting more light onto it. I sort of feel like I can tell when it's unnatural lighting. And it it bothers me a little bit, but it's also so hard to work within the parameters of a film schedule to get all of the shots that you want within the lighting that you want. So I understand it, but for Defining Dota, I would say the lighting worked out really well. We also have another really cool shot um, where the police are coming and our gaffer made it so there were red and blue lights reflected on the characters as if the police were coming in without having an actual police truck. And the way that it hits the characters looks really interesting. So those were some of the lighting moments that I really liked. Yeah, that's a trick uh, from the gaffer, you know. And uh, Mm -hmm. they um, they they can create an atmosphere. You know, it's uh, pretty amazing because, uh, of course, uh, the daylight is changing all the all the day, and you have to uh, you have to be imaginative. You know, in a way. Right. Right. So how? What uh, um, what is your best experience on set? Uh, did, do you have some any anecdotes, maybe? My best experience on set was probably creating the uh, human trafficking documentary outside of Philadelphia that I talked about, because we did it in July of 2020, so like mid-pandemic. And I was one of those people that was extremely worried about COVID. Um, my co-producer on the film flew from California to Philadelphia to film it. And I Amazon primed her face shields to wear on the plane because I was so nervous about COVID. I went home to Philadelphia and was staying with my parents. So I was really worried about infecting my parents. Um, so I think we were all so starved to create that to be able to create meant so much. And that project is really special because it's based on the book, A Shield Against the Monster by Carol Metzger and Anne-Marie Jones. And Anne-Marie Jones is a real survivor of human trafficking outside the Philadelphia area. And I had made my dad drive around Philadelphia with me to find a spot that looked most like Kensington, which is where the human trafficking outside the Philadelphia area predominantly happens. And we couldn't film in Kensington because during the pandemic, it was kind of dangerous to be there. There was a lot of COVID going around. So it wasn't safe to bring in a film crew at that point and to bring in actors. So we had to find something that looked like it, but wasn't it. Before we filmed, before the pandemic, they had taken me through Kensington so that I could really experience what Kensington is like and you know, not see exactly the trafficking happening, but get a gist for all of these victims that are in the area and see the conditions that they're living in. And it was awful. And one of the things that Anne-Marie does is that she brings roses to the victims in Kensington and hands them out to the victims there and says to them, you are worth so much. I know what you're going through. I understand you don't have to be in this life. And it was such a powerful experience for me and like nothing that I had ever experienced. So it was really important to me to do justice to making sure that the area and the locations that we found really did resemble Kensington because I wanted that experience to be honored on film. And when we got to the location, Carol, who's one of the authors of A Shield Against the Monster and the researcher and Anne-Marie's point person came and started tearing up because of how similar the locations looked. And she just couldn't believe how we had found a location that resembled so much um, Kensington. 
And it meant so much to me to be able to see the people who we're creating this film for and the messaging that we're trying to get out and people who really understand um, this horrible thing that's happening outside of Philadelphia to be able to honor that location and do the best that we could to bring that to life on film. Yeah, it's a, um, an important topic because uh, it's pretty much everywhere. You know, I think even right. in Europe, I've heard I've heard about it in Australia uh, when mm -hmm. I was there. Um, and, um, I don't. Know, it's still it's it's a modern in modern days. It's still there, unfortunately. And um, it's great you 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 have the SCIG and to and to, to to shine light on this matter because. Uh, it's a it's an, an important topic because for the society mm -hmm. and uh, and I don't know if there is too much women or men I don't know. Yeah, it predominantly affects women, but it affects everyone. Um, but you're right; it definitely is happening all over the world, and that's one of the things we want to do after the documentary is potentially turn it into an anthology and explore trafficking all over the world um, to hopefully shine a broader light on it and eventually put an end to it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you have other anecdotes or you want to add another thing or other anecdotes? Um, hmm, what an interesting question. I guess I would say another anecdote would just be to be really sure of your vision before going into filming because you're going to be dealing with so many varying opinions on set that you have to be really sure of the film that you wanted to create and how you want this film to come out because it's really easy to be susceptible to other people's opinions who may or may not know what they're talking about and you have to be really confident and stick with it. I think that other people's opinions are so important and I do think it's really important to take in their feedback as well, but just make sure that you're taking everything with a grain of salt and that nothing is getting in the way of creating the project that you had envisioned. Yeah, I think you're, you're well said, well said because uh... Hey, of course, you have you have some you take some feedback from people, of course, and right. you, have, you have your vision, and uh, yeah, you're you're the filmmaker, director, basically, you, you, you know what you know what you need to do. So, right, right, right. Um, so you always wanted to do this job, and how can you uh, find the balance with uh, I don't know private life and um, this kind of job? Or you need to find another job, uh, different activities? Uh, how can you find this balance? I think that the balance sort of comes naturally. I feel like you know what's the most important to you right now and what needs the most of your attention at that moment. Um, for me, I think that balancing social life and career, I, at this point, am really dedicated to my career and wanting to be more successful in my career that that sort of feels like it has the precedence of my time. Um, but, you know, I do make sure that I make time for family and friends and myself. And I think that finding that balance is important, but I also think that it comes naturally and just, you know, what needs the most time and what needs the most of your attention. Uh, yeah. All right. And um, have you um, have you tried the, the crowdfunding, the fundraising? Yeah, I have. We've fundraised for uh, multiple of our films, yeah. How was it the experience? Was uh, good, bad? No, both times really good. We did it for It's a Girl Thing, which did really well in the festivals. And then we just did it for the human trafficking documentary. And I'm really grateful for everybody who was willing to donate. Um, I would say that, you know, <laughs> you'd be surprised on the amount of people that are willing to support you. It's a little bit of a funny thing to ask people for money to help you create. But also, for a lot of us, it's the only way that we can be able to create. So I think joining forces with your co-producers and the other people on set for finding all of your networks is a great way um, to make sure that your film projects happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very uh, it's great. It's great was uh, um, some uh, to have some uh, donors to to fund for this uh, for this cause. Yeah, great, good, right, good, right. Um, have you um, have you experienced uh, the film festivals? Yep, definitely. Um, I've been really lucky to go to a few film festivals. It's a girl thing got into, I think, like 14 all over the world. But we didn't get to go to a lot of them because it happened when the pandemic was also like at the highest point of it. 
Um, but we were lucky that we were able to go to two before the pandemic and then a film festival in Miami really recently. That was an amazing experience. And the one that I just mentioned for Defining Dodo. I love the film festivals. I think you can learn so much. I think they're a great experience to make connections and also to meet like-minded people who want to create just as much as you do. Yeah. So uh, have you been to Europe or outside of the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. So I studied in London. I studied in France. Yeah, for, um, for the festivals. Oh, no. I We actually got it to a couple in Italy that we had wanted to go to, but it was coinciding with the pandemic. So hopefully with some of the other projects, we get to actually go out of the country for festivals. That would be really cool. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, after yeah. this episode, <laughs> I don't know when. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll see. Maybe, hopefully next year or something. Yeah. Um, uh, with the technology nowadays, uh, someone can buy a camera, can buy a video editing, and uh, can start make it, making a film. And do you think it's positive, negative? Or this is the future of cinema? Or? That's a really interesting question. I think that it's positive because I think everybody should have the opportunity to create. I think, um, you know, it's funny because also anybody can be an actor and some of us pay lots of money to go to school for acting for years. But I think it's a positive experience that everybody should be able to create. Um, and I think that it's, you know, your personal choice. If you want to go to school to learn more about it, that's up to you. But anybody, I think, should be able to create. And I think that that's just being understanding of the future also. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was generalized, generalized uh, this, uh, this tool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about the, um, the current cinema nowadays, lately? Uh, maybe you can, you can tell me uh, what you think about the American cinema as well, if you want. Yeah, I think it's definitely changing a lot. Um, I don't know if you were able to see Clint Eastwood's new film, Cry Macho, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, and also like great to see that he's still creating at 90 years old. Um, I think that film has definitely shifted recently. I'm happy to see that the industry is becoming more inclusive to lots of different communities and that we're focusing more on telling everybody's story rather than just um, a select group of people. So I think it's moving in a positive direction. Um, I'm happy to see that. I think that we're being a lot more inclusive of who we're casting as well, which is a great thing. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think about the, you know, the, the streaming services? And... Um... Yeah, what do you think about, uh, about them? They're great for actors uh, like Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max. It's created so much more opportunity, which I think is super positive. Yeah. Sorry, this yeah. dog is going to be crazy. Let me grab it. It's better outside. He won't, he won't, he, uh, maybe he wants to be on, on camera. Yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was I was wondering because you know um, um, there is the th streaming services like this, and um, on the other hand, you have uh, of course the the theaters. And do you think I don't know? Uh, for me, um, I want to go to the movies, of course. But I want to also to consume some movies um, at home, you know, I want both. But uh, yeah. the kind of movie I want to go, maybe it's like um, an, um, an event, you know, something mm -hmm. like uh, entertaining, like uh, not something, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know I, like I, a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or something like that. Something like that, but uh, recently I was thinking about, you know, Dune or Matrix 4 or something like this. Yeah. I really want to go to the movies like this. And yeah. at home, I don't know, it's different. Um, it depends on the season. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I don't know what you, what you think about uh, all of it. Uh, you're, you're basically, you're I, agree, yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I love to be able to consume it either way because going to the movies is so fun and they've elevated the movie experience so much. I mean, now it's like going to a restaurant in the movie theater. Um, you can order drinks and you have the layback chairs and everything. But I agree. I think having both is important. I was sad to see all of the AMCs going out of business during the pandemic. I don't know if you guys have those there, but that's what the main uh, movie chain is in the US. Um, 
But I think Netflix actually ended up buying the movie chain, which is a funny turn of events. But yeah, I agree with you. I want to be able to consume film and television both uh, on Netflix and in the theaters. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have the opportunity to work with someone, who could it be? Audrey Hepburn. Want to say it again? Audrey Hepburn. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe in, in digital way, maybe. She's just a classic and yeah. um, had such a great mind and was really great at doing a nonprofit work in her personal life also. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, uh, she, she was a great actress. Uh, she, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Different, different yeah. movies. Uh, yeah, different movies. Uh, very popular. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Really iconic. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Do yeah. you... Do you do you do you have um, another one uh, on mind? Or... Another one? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think Princess Diana would be really cool, but uh, I would also love to walk with Hillary Clinton, still alive. But yeah. and what about the um, maybe the directors or uh, because you're, you're still an actress, right? You're still yeah yeah yeah. And um... uh, Lawrence Olivier, I think, would be awesome. Okay, uh, take note. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was like, because like it's like um, I don't know, um, I was asking this question to everyone basically to to find the 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 idea the idea to to work with uh, in in films. So it's uh, it's pretty interesting. So that's why. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you wish um, as a filmmaker in a short, mid, and long run? What do I wish? Uh, yeah, what in the near future, uh, and the twenty years uh, in twenty years as well. Like, what do I want the? Sorry, I'm I'm not understanding. I'm sorry, the my my okay. <laughs> what do you wish as a filmmaker in the in the uh -huh. in the short and mid and long run? Oh, I see. Okay, um, hmm, interesting question. Long term, you know, I would love to create more and more projects um, and make a difference in the world of cinema and who gets to come to the table and the types of projects that I'm able to create and the types of stories that I'm able to tell. Um, short term, you know, really building my acting career and uh, getting more opportunities and, yeah, really fostering that because I think in the midterm, midterm in my career, I'd like to eventually be able to open up my own production company and um, create more projects that way to facilitate my long-term career goals. Okay, I hope you're going to make it. Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. uh, which, uh, which tips uh, can you give to someone who's going to start? Um, believe in yourself and be in it for the long haul. I think persistence is everything. I think too many people get into this industry and see that they're not succeeding right away and then give up on it way too early. I think that you have to be really dedicated for it to be difficult in the beginning, to not see a lot of opportunities in the beginning. But as you continue to get more footing in the industry and as long as you hang in there, like um, eventually you'll be the last man standing and you'll have learned a lot and learned from your experiences and your failures to make your own success within the industry. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, which um, which movie or series uh, did grab your attention lately? Lately, hmm. Good question. Um, <laughs> do you know the series Monarca? Uh, Monarca. It's a Mexican series. I speak Spanish, um, so I I binged the last two seasons of that, and then it got canceled. So uh, I'll never Netflix? know what happens to the family. Mm -hmm, yeah, on Netflix. <laughs> I don't know how they work there, but um, maybe you know the the, the algorithm, algorithm, the, the no, the, the AI, oh the algorithm, algorithm, yeah, the AI, yeah. It was it's that's why they I think they canceled the the, the series. Or, you know. Yeah. So how yeah. was it? How was the? So what is it that this series? Tell me. I don't think it's necessarily that good. Um, but I think that they utilize so many different plot lines that it was funny to me how much they were able to pack in into this series. And one of the things that I really admired about it was that 
it was really nouveau for um, Mexican culture and the types of films that I've seen them create before. And it was very inclusive. And I thought that was all very interesting. It definitely keeps your attention going. Um, it's not like cinematic gold or anything, but the scenery is really beautiful. It's shot in Mexico. It's awesome to see the agave fields and the houses that everything takes place in. So it was very entertaining and my last binge watch. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't to, doesn't mean to be a masterpiece or something. If you like right. it, you like it. Yeah. Right. So that's uh, and there's no formula for that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> One. No way. Sure, if you are interested in following along more of my projects, you can visit my website at laurenelizabethharris.com or follow me on Instagram at Lauren Elizabeth Harris. It's one H between Elizabeth and Harris, just to clarify. And um, yeah, you can learn more about my projects there. I have the links to everything in my bio if you're interested in following along.